a self-described girl from the south side of Chicago. She has worked at the intersection of public policy and community equity and inclusion for more than 30 years. As president and CEO of Chicago Foundation for Women, she leads strategic efforts to invest in women and girls, transgender and gender non-binary people, fighting for gender equity and building stronger communities for all. Since its founding in 1985, CFW has invested more than $45 million in organizations supporting women and girls across the Chicago region. Please join me and the woman whose work is never done, Felicia Davis Blakely, on the winter premiere of In the Arena, right now. Three, two, one. Felicia Davis Blakely. Hi. Or as I like to do it as of last week, Felicia. Felicia. <laughs> How are you, my friend? I am great. Thank you. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. You are the first guest of the winter season. We like to start things off with a bang, so I figured I'd call you. Um, this woman's work is never done, and Ooh. I figured we'd get you here to talk a bit about it all. Oh, man. I Come love on, it. Let's do it. But let's begin <laughs> at the beginning. Okay. <laughs> You were born in October of 1969 at Cook County Hospital. Yes. And when we did the pre-interview, you said, without skipping a beat, and that should tell you everything you need to know about That should tell you everything you need to know. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I love how you said that. Tell me about the man and the woman who created you. My mom, Denise, um, whose shoulders I stand on today, really. I'm just grateful she's still around to see the trees blossom from seeds she planted so long mm. ago and I had a couple I had a, a man who raised me and then I had my biological father let's talk about that. Um, and they're both deceased now mm. but so the man who raised me um, you know he had he took in a woman right they he married a woman mm -hmm. who already had three girls mm -hmm. And he didn't even blink about it. Mm. And uh, together they had my brother. Um, so I'm the oldest of four. And he was just, you know, an amazing man. Mm. Wonderful. Um, speaking of the oldest of four, you have two younger sisters and the baby brother. Yep. My heart just aches for him because I can only imagine. Well, you <laughs> aching for him for because... You know. I, mm, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me just ask some questions, because I think it'll become clear. Um, are the four of you close to this day? Yes. Okay. How often do you talk? Uh, well, my, the sister that, you know, she and I are not exactly one year apart, okay. uh, so we're almost twins in a way. Mm -hmm. um, we talk the most, okay. uh, so almost constantly. Nice. Uh, my brother, not as much, and my sister, because they're from a distance standpoint. My sister's down in Texas. Okay. And my brother is in Western Illinois. So I think if I were to call your brother, again, I, like your brother, until my 13 year, my junior sister came along, um, I was the baby of the family. And I remember thinking, you can't all be my parents. <laughs> um, would your siblings suggest such a thing about you as the oldest sibling that sometimes it was unclear? Oh, totally. I mean, uh, I, that's, I thought you might say something else. Like, oh, you're totally. like, that's not controversial. That's not controversial. Yes, yes, I ran yes, this. That is a fact. <laughs> and uh, depending on the day you talk to my mom, she might tell oh, come you. On. Come on, <laughs> listen, listen. Um, and we're going to talk more about your mom because I, I, I've said this to you. Your relationship with your mom is um, so beautiful. Um, and just, I, I want the audience, the viewers to hear you talk about it. It's just, it's the power. Um, of, of our forebearers pouring into us and then we running forward with both of our dreams. Mm -hmm. um, but before I get there, you graduated from Cur Percy mm -hmm. Julian High School. PLJ, in get it right. Mm -hmm. I mean, yes, okay, yes. <laughs> Is there a rivalry? You know what, I want, no, I want to go okay. back to born at Cook County Hospital that tells you everything you <laughs> need to know about me. I'm always looking for themes, so I wasn't even starting anything and I feel like, woo. <laughs> That's energy. How wonderful. You received your college degree 
So graduated Percy Julian High School in 19, 1987. You received your college degree from Kendall College and ITT in 2005. Walk me through your life in the years between 1987 when you graduated high school and 2005 when you earned your undergraduate Man, degree. that is a whole show all Come, by itself. Let's, be, let let's get as much say. as we can get in. Um, <laughs> so I, and I say this because it's important. I was one of those uh, late career or late degree career people, but I was already well established in my career. Um, in that time, I was married, I had children, I was at home with those children, but I had some other jobs. I was a clerk at, a uh, criminal court clerk at 26 in California. Um, I had, I worked in uh, an emergency room, because uh, originally I was a pre-med major, mm. and so I did that. And so I was just living my life, but I joined the Chicago Police Department in 1991, and I think that's the, it's a seminal moment mm. in my um, in my professional and really personal career. And I spent 10 years in, in the Chicago Police Department. I'm, I'm just gonna say that because I assume we'll talk about that later. Mm -hmm. uh, I transitioned uh, as my family grew. I took another, uh, which women do, off ramp um, out of the yes. workforce. And I went up to Kendall College originally because as a member of the Chicago Police Department, I figured I'd do my, you know, 25, 30 years, I retire uh, at a reasonably young age, and I would and I would open a bed and breakfast. Oh, nice! Okay. And so that's what drew me all the way up to Evanston at the time mm. um, to study culinary arts, hospitality, and uh, bread and breakfast management, mm. really. Um, and so that was where I when I mean, this is when I went back to school, right? I was a mom to five kids. Okay. Um, and they are currently ages 21 to 34. 21 oh. and 34. Four boys, one daughter. Whew. And at that time, you were, you were a mom to five kids, but you were a detective at that point. Yes. Uh, ten years on the police department, uh, two years in patrol, mm. and eight years as an investigator. First I did... Um, which is difficult. I, I talk about it, but the first um, investigative responsibilities I had, then they called it the crime car, mm. which um, was the cases that were called into the child abuse hotline as a youth officer, um, which were very, if, if you can imagine mm. why people would be calling mm. the child mm. abuse hotline, it was very um, mm. poignant work, I would say. And, you know, I think about that to this day. Uh, and then I transitioned over to the violent crime side where I investigated sex-related offenses. Mm. And so both of those are pretty heavy. I, um, there isn't a day that goes by that I don't think about some aspect of that work. I don't think about um, a person mm. um, who I encountered whose life was forever changed because of what happened to them. Yeah. yeah. It, it, wow. Um, that, that stopped me cold because it takes me in a direction about... Being a mother of five, um, building your family, building your career, and working in that space, um, what do you do for mental health? Uh, how do you protect? How did you protect? How do you protect it then, and how is it different or the same as you protect it now? This is a really important question. I mean, especially because I mean, I still have friends who are in the Chicago Police Department, and uh, a lot has been said about the mental health mm. of and well-being of officers today. Yeah. Um, I will tell you what I always believed and part of the secret sauce, I guess, about how I was able to traverse all of that. Um, really, in our lives, we have to have things that keep us grounded. Mm. North we stars. And for, and for me, it was always, it was my faith, mm. it was my, and it was my family. And uh, those things were my North Star. They centered me and they kept me balanced. Mm. Um, and they made me, or allowed me, I think, in some ways, to put the work in perspective. Fair. Uh, your, first, your first real job, um, because, I, I, again, in these conversations, I always, there are themes. And where you sit now, um, there have been themes. And your first real job was as a clerk at the criminal court building. So I'm going to ask more directly, how did that experience um, and you touched a bit on it in, in your work as, as a detective, but how did that experience, what you saw as a clerk, um, when sometimes people are not paying close attention, you get to see everything. Yeah. Um, how did that experience shape the trajectory of your career, um, and what 
to those of us watching and who know you and work with you and sit on panels with you is an incredibly intentional commitment um, to equal access, social and economic justice. Yeah, I, you know, and that part of it began long before mm. the time that I was working at 26 in California. But in my time at 26 in California, because you know, when you're living life, you you don't you don't most people. I mean, I know a few people, but you don't plan out the fullness of your life and say, "I'm going to do this by this point, this by yeah. this point." I mean, those who do, it's folly because life, hurt. <laughs> life doesn't you know go. Life goes hold linear my beer. In yeah. That way. yeah. Um, but I, but the things that I remember, you know, obviously, the people who were coming to the courthouse who were um, defendants mm. and what they look like, mm -hmm. they look like members of my community. Mm. Um, I remember um, hearing, you know, it was not, um, it was typical to hear like anguished cries mm. when someone has been convicted. Mm. I remember, um, and this was. I mean, in a way, it was fascinating, uh, and I guess it was good I had a strong stomach, but I would have these huge files, I would have these conviction files, and it would literally have every piece of evidence about the case, so mm. there would be really graphic photographs mm. if it was a violent, if it was mostly violent crimes, mm -hmm. and, but they, but those files to me also told a story about people, mm. right, on both sides, you know, something that I say today um, because of the work I do at the foundation and, and because of the particular gun violence problem that we have in Chicago um, and the way in which um, a lot of the attention is focused on, on men, but the attention that's not focused on women, and I often say there's a mother on either side of that bullet, mm. right? There's yes. a family on either side of that bullet. And uh, that inter those intersection points um, are life-changing for all involved. And so I think, you know, I'm a Libra. I was born in October. I'm a Libra. And they say you're naturally a person, you know, who seeks justice mm -hmm. and equity. I'm, you know, those scales are the symbol that represents my zodiac sign. And so I think those early, uh, that first real job, right, um, was all about justice mm -hmm. in a way. I don't know that I was thinking about equity as yet, but mm -hmm. as I started in this, you know, talking about this, thinking about who's walking in the front door um, as a about defendant. It before you gave it the name. Yeah, 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 and who's going out the back door mm -hmm. into, the, into the jail. How about that? Let's, um, it's just fascinating. Um, the trajectory of your career, um, and I'm just going to, let me, because I look at your background, I remember when I first met you and I looked at your background, I went, what an interesting human being. You can't, I'm like, you can't reproduce this. <laughs> you, you re oh, so let me, I'm just going to cover some pieces. Um, in addition to that, I read an article where it went, and I may be, I may not get it exactly right, but literally an article going, the mayor's top fixer or troubleshooter goes over, um, to city colleges. And Juan Salgado's very first day as chancellor, that was the first thing he did, was bring you over from the city. I think about you going in as a police officer and then becoming a detective in Chicago um, as a, a, a black woman, um, a mother of a growing family. Um, and, and, and family has been your North Star mm -hmm. um, through that, because none of the work, you just don't like easy work, do you? That's not, that's not your thing. <laughs> that's not your ministry. <laughs> you, you're like, ooh. Um, so, but I do want to talk about um, your mom. And I want you to tell me your relationship and just talk to me about her. Take me where you want to take me on that relationship. Well, her name is Denise, but everybody calls her Dee Dee. Hi, Dee Dee. Um, <laughs> and she, you know, I would, I, the way I describe her, my mother was wise beyond her years. Mm -hmm. um, some of my earliest lessons were um, around the responsibility we have to and for each other. And we were not, I want to be clear about this, we were not people of wealth mm -hmm. and by any means. Um, we were very, you know, we, at times we were food insecure, mm. housing insecure, clothing insecure. Um, so it was very lean. But my mom never failed to um, show us, demonstrate in action and to teach us that we still could be of service to others, right? And so today that word, 
is called philanthropy, right? That's the fancy I word for that, it. Yes. Um, mutual aid, yep. how, you know, fancy, another yep. fancy word for it. But those early lessons were really powerful. The other um, pivotal lesson I learned at an early age was my mother said to me, now I'm going to say this because she said it, but I'm not calling my mama fat. Let me just be clear. But my mother we'll said. We'll see what she thinks okay, when she watches she, the playback. Go said, on. <laughs> um, listen, she said, I'm fat, I'm black, and I'm a woman. Come on. And that's what people see when I walk through the door. That's the only thing that they see. And she says, you're black and you're a woman. And those things they see first. And so she used this as a, a bridge to tell me about work ethic. And she said, that means, you know, baby girl, your work has to be stellar. And you have to do a good job for yourself and know that you have done a great job. And I don't care what you do. She's like, I don't care if you're a street sweeper or a street walker. Now, Didi don't play. Was she talking to my mother? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> oh, go on. Oh. She said, whatever it is, whatever it is, whatever no it judgment, is but do it well. you need to do it well. And, mm. I, and, and part of that to me as I think about why I say she's wise beyond her years is because she knew the gender oppression that I would face, the racial and gender oppression, right? So that double layer yes, of yeah. it. And she knew that there would be times that because of my race and because of my gender, my work would not be as valued. But she needed, she fortified me in a mm. way to know that. I do good work, Come on. right? Own that. My mama taught me a long time ago, and I do good work. And so that was a crazy, crazy work ethic, mm. and it's part of the reason, um, you know, it's part of the reason why I think I've been so successful in traversing different mm. career fields and transferring, you know, what I've learned in my skill set to other areas. Did your mom have a college degree? No. My mom did not. Probably she, smarter than everybody in this she, studio right now. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she dropped out of high school mm. when she became pregnant with me. Mm. And, you know, but she always stressed education to us. And the thing, now this is a point where I might cry. Um, and so when I was a young girl, she, she would always say, um, you know, how important it was for us to go to school, how important our grades were. And she was really a stickler for that. Mm. And when I was about... 11 or 12, she said, you know, she had a conversation with herself. And, you know, we've had lots of conversations about it since. But she said, if I tell you education is important, then I have to show you. And she went back to city colleges, to community colleges, me cry. to get her GED. Come on, lady. And she didn't have a babysitter. She had to mm -hmm. take us with her. And mm. so as a young girl, my mother was going back to school to mm. get her GED. She took us to Olive Harvey, which becomes important to me later in my career. Um, and I remember they, the people there, welcomed us. I don't know how often women back then mm. had to bring their kids yeah. to, to school with them, but they didn't bat an eye. They gave us a comfortable environment, and then they taught us stuff. They gave us educational um, papers mm. and, 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 and work to do that I am telling you helped me. I remember doing some of that work when I was sitting there waiting for my mom to get out um, and then later seeing some of that same work mm. in my own uh, mm. elementary school. Whew. I, it, my floor manager is looking at me. I know the looks. I'm gonna, w w you and I are gonna continue the conversation, um, but I, I do wanna ask about who is Derek Blakely, <laughs> and how did the two of you first meet? <laughs> Derek's my husband. Um, he's a retired uh, reporter. One of the network stations here? Yeah, yeah you know. I'm not sure, sure. Somewhere sure. around town. Okay. Huh. Um, and we met, we originally met in my, I mean, in the hallways, the comings and goings at City Hall. Mm. You know, I was in the uh, administration, yes. he was the political reporter, yes. and we would see each other in passing. So that's when we actually first met. Mm. Um, who fell in love first? Now, okay. He did. I'm not. Okay. He did. Okay. He, did. Just, he totally did. Okay. He totally did. Okay. Um, yeah. I'll come back to that. <laughs> um, you're you you are after being interim president of Olive Harvey, mm -hmm. where your mom is that not? Mm -hmm. That's just. The, it was the a divine. full circle moment. Yes. Yeah. That's that. Oh, mm. I'm gonna focus. Um, you had stints in the mayor's office, city colleges of Chicago. And in 1980, 2019, March 2019, you became the president and CEO of Chicago Foundation for Women. Yes. Why did you go there? What brought you there? You know and what? Um, part of it is, so my whole life has been about service to others. Mm -hmm. 
And when you work in, I was an, an appointed official working for an elected person, mm -hmm. you don't have the uh, leeway to like bring your total full self because you can't really say all of what you think and believe about a subject, right? You're advocating someone else's vision. And so I made a promise to myself that the next, you know, 2018, my mother was really sick. My, so there was a, my aunt was really sick. Mm -hmm. There was a lot and it really crystallized like what's important for me. And I made a commitment to myself that the next work that I would do would be something that I personally, like what I personally believe mm. and what I would do, it, it, that my, there would be uh, a very short distance between my professional work and my personal beliefs. And mm. I had been working on a committee for the foundation at the time mm -hmm. and the CEO announced that she was leaving. And then some people said to me, you should consider that job. And I didn't, cause I wasn't, I'm not, a, I wasn't in philanthropy, right? right? And so I didn't initially say, oh, that job is for fit. me, yeah. right? But people kept coming to me, and then I thought about that story about two boats and a helicopter. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, maybe this is a sign, and the rest is history. And on that note, uh, I, thank you. And, 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 and whenever I call, you answer your your generosity of spirit to me, this transplant in Chicago for 13 years, um, your kind words of support to the, to the work that's happening here. It is, it is an absolute, absolute pleasure. Um, this beautiful lady and I are going to be right back with our final segment called Three for the Road. Stay with us. Did you see how I knew which camera to go? What? Because that's different. I'm Kimberly Loftus, a CPA and a financial executive, and I want you to know that you are not alone in your money journey. On my new show, In The Money, we will have the finance talks that we didn't have as kids. Let me share the gift of financial freedom with you that will lead to less stress around money. In The Money premieres on Thursday, January 12th at 7.30 p.m. on Can TV 19. <laughs> we are going to do the final segment. It's called Three for the Road. Okay. It involves me asking you three questions and you giving me three responses. I feel like this is about to be a setup. I don't even understand why you don't trust me. <laughs> I feel like, going back to the Julian, the Percy Julian comment, like, I feel like you feel like I, I'm not coming. Okay. Your family. Right. <laughs> but let's begin. All right. <laughs> uh, if you could have dinner with any person, living or dead, who would it be and why? Oh my gosh. It would be my grandmother because she died when my mother was 12. Mm -hmm. So it would be for both of us. Mm -hmm. And and so obviously I never got to meet her. Uh, she's the first person that comes to my mind. And it would be a dinner. My mom would be there um, so that I could get to know her. But honestly, I think so my mom could get to know her too. Oh, the power of that three. Good first answer. Okay. Okay. All let, right. Let's go for number two. All right. Do you have any regrets? Yes. Come on. Oh my God. <laughs> let's begin. Okay. <laughs> I um, worked in, you know, volunteered, worked in political campaigns, mm -hmm. and I worked for uh, President Barack Obama twice before he was president. Mm -hmm. So once when he ran for Congress and when he ran for Senate, and he had just published the book, Dreams of My Father. And we were in the, like, printing the, we were like I was making copies, and I think he'd come in to get some office. Oh, you were so in the room. I, we were in the small little room. He was getting something off the shelf, and that's where the books were. And he was like, Felicia, you want to copy my book? I was like, oh, sure. And he said, do you want me to sign it? I was like, oh, no, that's okay. So I was... Get off the set. I know. <laughs> Don't pick me up. <laughs> I, I bet you that I, just, I, 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 you know, the pain you must the, fill up from that decision I, alone you, is I'm, more than anything. I'm telling I, you. Like, I, you're I literally like, writing I, her I, going, I, no, it's good. I was like, no, it's okay. I don't want to, I don't want to trouble you. It's good. Yeah. yeah. We're going to find, we're going to find him and we're going to get you your signature. <laughs> so, 
If he's listening. Okay, li listen. <laughs> I we're, still have the book. <laughs> we're going streaming and digital. We, we're going to get that message out. That's incomplete. We need to fix that. My final question for you. One piece of advice present-day Felicia would have given her 21-year-old self. Save more for retirement. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. So. <laughs> I'm really, I mean, it, it is, it's a bigger part of that too. I mean, yes. I work at a women's foundation every single day. Yes. Women still, today was, you know, women know still exactly. today yes. earn less than men. Yeah. And so we have that pay and equity. Yeah. We also don't take the stretch assignments. You know, mm. there's a lot there. And yeah. so I would tell myself, girl, you better save for retirement. Come on. Yeah. Um, here's, I'm going to, um, cheat a little bit. Because mm -hmm. uh, I think that's number four. I can't, you I know mean, what? I went to public school, but <laughs> I still know how to count. But you're not, what you're not going to do, you're not going to walk in here and treat me this way in my own house. <laughs> it is, I, math wasn't my thing. <laughs> but my, maybe my final question. Okay. Um, back to Chicago Foundation for Women. What do you want your legacy to be as president and CEO? I want, by the time that I am done um, and, with, and my tenure at CFW, well, I want every woman, I want um, every girl to see themselves reflected in our work. Mm. I want there to be a clear through line mm. between what their lived experiences are in Chicago um, and our work. A black girl growing up in Chicago has a different experience from a Latina girl growing mm -hmm. up in Chicago who has a different experience mm -hmm. from an indigenous or native girl growing up in Chicago mm -hmm. has a different experience from a white girl, and so forth and so on. Mm -hmm. I want them to all see their lived experience reflected in some aspect of our work. Wow. My. Whew. I knew you were going to, I knew you were going to bring it um, because the last time we were together in the public um, place, I was moderating a panel that you were on and you dropped so much truth to power that an audience member passed out. Remember that? <laughs> sure, it's, 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 remember. it's facts. It's that not untrue. True. That, that, is, true. that <laughs> is true. So Felicia, thank you, my friend. I, I can't thank you enough. Listen, um, Felicia and I are going to be continuing this conversation because we absolutely have to on In the Arena Extra. It is exclusively available on our shiny, bright, wonderful, new, interactive website, cantv.org. In the meantime, Chicago and beyond, thank you for joining us tonight in the arena. Let me leave you with a final thought for the road, courtesy of Nigerian actress, Shinoe Shidulu. Dear woman, protect your identity as fiercely as possible. Embrace your freedom with so much selfishness. Live in your truth and enjoy watching your beautiful petals blossom as you journey through your process. Don't accept any definition that is not you. Don't accept choices that take away from your power. Own it, woman. Own it. Until next time, take good care of you and each other. Good night. We should probably talk or something. Okay, yeah. let's, oh, no, let them applaud. Let Thank them you. applaud. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. You're, one, you're wonderful people. I give good interviews. Okay. I give, I, uh...